That's uh, an excellent point. Thank you, Gary. Can you hear me fine? I hope yeah. you can hear me. Good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, loud yes, and clear. Uh, great. Hi, everyone. Thanks to the organisers for the invite and to Gary for the introduction. Um, so, uh, electron diffraction actually has a really quite a long history going back to the 1930s, which has developed to some extent independently from, from X-ray diffraction. But here, though, I'm referring rather more specifically to the method now commonly known as microED, which is, uh, I guess, a bit less than one decade old now. And that method uh, rather more knowingly borrows from the rotation method experiment um, uh, of, of X-ray crystallography. So we can think of this as doing familiar crystallography experiments, but in an electron microscope. Uh, this technique has been used in recent, uh, recent years to solve uh, structures of proteins and uh, small molecules from tiny crystals. And here, the, the term vanishingly small is meant quite literally. The, the, the crystals are smaller than the shortest wavelengths of visible light, so you can't see them in, in a light microscope. Uh, here's a schematic just to show you the scale of a, a nanocrystal that might be suitable for use in, in electron diffraction compared to a typical microcrystal uh, suitable for X-ray diffraction at a microfocus beamline um, uh, of five micron uh, to a side. Um, so how is this possible? Well, the key point that, that's been mentioned before is that electrons scatter much more strongly than X-rays. Um, and Kaitara showed a much more comprehensive slide than this cartoon, so uh, apologies to the uh, purists and physicists in the audience. Uh, but uh, what Whereas X-rays scatter from the uh, electron clouds and therefore probe electron density, uh, we can consider that electrons are scattering from the nucleus and uh, probing the electrostatic potential of the crystal. The electron cloud in this case uh, shields the nuclear potential uh, and that means that uh, scattering factors are highly dependent on the ionization state of the atom. So, uh, in principle, the charge state of atoms could be investigated by this method. Another quite interesting point is despite the, the, the very high energy of fast electron beams, um, the amount of energy that is deposited uh, per inelastic event is far lower than, than with X-rays. So we're talking about 40 EVs or so per event compared to you know, a whole 12 keV photon. Uh, so for that reason, the ratio of useful scattering to damage is very efficient in electron diffraction. Uh, and as, as an X-ray crystallographer by training, I, I find it quite instructive to consider how electron diffraction experiments look in the laboratory frame. Um, so when we, when we take typical uh, X-ray MX geometry, we have a large and very expensive detector quite close to the sample with uh, high scattering angles from uh, a relatively large crystal down to approximately a micron size. Um, with electron diffraction, you have a, a, a detector that's both very small and uh, effectively quite far away. Um, there's a tiny crystal of a sub-micron size uh, that's probably bathed in the electron beam, but uh, beam sizes can also be made very tiny in the electron microscope. Of course, this um, large detector distance is a lie. It's, uh, it's only an effective distance. In truth, the distance in the microscope is fixed, and this effective distance is a function of the lenses of the microscope. Uh, here's an example um, from when I started with electron diffraction. Um, this comes from uh, Max Klabbers and co-authors at Basel and the PSI, uh, who solved the structure of this unusual orthorhombic form of lysozyme. And they could solve this from a single crystal with uh, less than 600,000 unit cells, uh, which might still stand as a record for the smallest single crystal, uh, single crystal structure solution, I'm not sure. Um, but we took that data set and others from similar crystals to develop enhancements for the, uh, to dials for electron diffraction processing. Um, here's a, a video of the diffraction patterns from that data, sh data set shown in the dials image viewer. Um, one thing you can see is that this detector is, a, is an unusual quad of time picks modules with large gaps uh, between them. Uh, that's not an ideal arrangement, clearly, but time picks does allow fine slice data collection with electron counting free from readout noise. So it's quite a good technology uh, otherwise. Um, 
processing that data uh, showed numerous problems that we had to address in order to get dials to work. Uh, so first, first of all, the lenses in, in electron microscopes uh, may introduce distortions into the diffraction patterns. And um, dials is a program that was born in the era of hybrid pixel array detectors, and it didn't have the means to correct distortions. Um, so we had to add that first. Uh, second thing is that the, the beam can drift during the experiment. Um, so we had to add a way to model that, and we, we added a way to model it uh, globally with a smoothly varying function. Uh, for this data set, we saw that the, the beam drifted by about uh, one or two pixels in each direction, which is not a huge amount, but correcting this does uh, improve the integration results. And thirdly, the, uh, the geometry of electron diffraction experiments can be quite challenging to model from the data. Um, so we investigated uh, various diagnostics and different refinement protocols to, to try to deal with that. Um, and as a result, the main message of the paper we published at that time was that these enhancements were required in dials to process that nanocrystal data set. But in fact, in practice, since uh, I find that we don't, you don't need all of those enhancements to process good electron diffraction data sets. Um, and for example, I haven't used the lens correction since, uh, although the beam drift correction is still sometimes quite useful. Uh, so after data processing of that case, uh, we solved the structure by molecular replacement with standard CCP4 tools uh, using the, the keywords for electron scattering in phaser and RefMAC. And here we get a view of um, 2.1 angstrom electrostatic potential map. Uh, doesn't look so different from uh, uh, electron density maps really at that resolution. Uh, the overall completeness of this data set is only 60%, but that's largely because of the limited tilt range in the microscope, which was uh, about 40 degrees. Um, so for that reason of low completeness, we reported uh, R1 and R complete rather than our work and R3. And you can see you get rather high values of uh, R complete. Um, and uh, th this is quite typical though for electron diffraction. It's much higher than you'd expect for X-ray diffraction. Uh, and I've got a bit more on that later. Um, a more recent example is the structure solution of uh, Cydia pomonella granulovirus occlusion bodies. Uh, and these are uh, crystalline shells that are naturally formed inside insect guts on uh, viral infection. So this thing, uh, CPGV, is deployed uh, worldwide in commercial apple orchards um, as a pesticide to control the pest coddling moth. Um, and these natural crystals are, are really tiny, as shown by this electron micrograph. Um, so each of these crystals has only about 9,000 unit cells. Um, in 2017, the structure of natural crystals was determined by, by X-ray uh, diffraction using an XFL uh, and 83,000 crystals required for that. Um, last year, there was very impressive work uh, producing a 1.55 angstrom structure uh, by serial electron diffraction, which required uh, 32,000 crystals. Uh, but together with uh, scientists from Thermo Fisher, um, uh, we solved the structure by rotation micro ED and the data set is admittedly not as high quality as the, the other two, but we only use 22 crystals. So um, in that case, processing the data with dials was, was relatively straightforward. So there was no requirement for uh, the lens distortion uh, correction. Uh, some of the samples did benefit from applying beam drift modeling though. Um, but despite the low relative radiation damage compared with X-ray diffraction that I mentioned before, the fact that these crystals were really so tiny meant that they still only diffracted for a, um, on average about 10 images each. So the main work in processing this data set was that the, the job of determining the right radiation damage cutoffs and excluding uh, particular data sets. And that's a familiar task for anyone who has combined um, many small wedge X-ray diffraction data sets too. So there's nothing really specific to electron diffraction about that. Um, at the time that we did this, I took hours over it manually exploring different cutoffs uh, with Aimless. But these days I can get essentially the same quality data set using automatic exclusions built into dial scale using the uh, Delta CC half metric. Uh, so the final data set in this case has a, had a high multiplicity of 12 times, which is uh, helped by the cubic symmetry of the crystals. Uh, 
And here's a view of the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the biological assembly with the uh, potential map. Um, and of course, this wasn't, it's not as high resolution as the serial LED uh, structure, but I still think it's quite remarkable that you could obtain this structure from 22 nanocrystals um, over a total of 260 diffraction images and only about 200,000 unit cells diffracting in total. Of course, in this case, there's essentially unlimited numbers of crystals available because um, they actually they spray this stuff on fields as a pesticide. Uh, but that may not necessarily always be the case. So uh, there may be cases where there's only a few crystals. And that leads me to this uh, side note. This is something I don't think has been well enough explored yet. Um, back in 2014, these researchers from the University of Pittsburgh looked at so-called failed crystallization trials uh, containing granular precipitate only, um, which is clearly the, the bane of many a PhD researcher's career. I remember that well. Um, but they put these under elect an electron microscope and found that in every case, they contained uh, nanocrystals. And I would love to see more people trying this out to see if they can get samples uh, suitable for micro ED if they can't grow bigger crystals. So clearly we can solve structures from, from tiny crystals, uh, but there's a, there's a question why the R factor is so bad for micro ED. And the, the reason there is largely the fact that the, the strength of the interaction that makes that method possible is also the factor that causes the problems. So uh, electrons are rather likely to scatter more than once as they pass through the sample. And this is a nice figure that's uh, come from work done in Jan Peter Abraham's lab at the PSI, which illustrates the possible fate <coughs> of an electron passing through um, a sort of 200 nanometer thick crystal. Um, and at 200 kV uh, uh, energy of the electrons, you see approximately 12% of those electrons will contribute to the uh, kinematic signal for which the, the F squared uh, proportion to I holds. But there's a further signal of about a, a quarter of that um, of electrons that also end up in the Bragg spots, uh, but for which this relationship uh, doesn't hold. So this is something that's um, uh, of, of extreme interest, uh, clearly, um, and uh, to, to attempt to investigate this experimentally, uh, Emma Beale at Diamond Light Source uh, took proteinase K crystals and then cut them using focused ion beam milling at uh, EBIC. But the clever trick was that she didn't cut the two faces parallel, but rotated the crystal slightly between the two cuts, uh, forming wedges with thicknesses um, varying between about 400 nanometers at the thick end and 200 nanometers at the thin end. And then uh, Emma collected data sets at each of three positions on each of um, three different crystals that she prepared this way. Um, and we've been trying to use this uh, data to explore the relationship between crystal thickness and uh, diffraction intensities. And this is very much um, live work that's uh, incomplete. So uh, what we've found so far is a somewhat subtle, but uh, nevertheless apparently systematic effect. So we took the, the positions for each crystal and scaled these together, uh, but with a simple scaling model emitting a resolution dependent scale terms, just an overall scale versus phi. Uh, then calculate a delta i value. So define that as the difference between each reflection in the thin data set uh, versus the, the thick data set. And the idea is that any structure left in that quantity after correcting the overall scale may say something about uh, physical differences between the data sets. I don't have any model uh, to fit the scatter plot, uh, so to help any kind of interpretation, I've added a moving average curve here. And what we see is that for the, the weakest reflections, the ones that are in fact so weak that they're negative, um, there's a tendency for the thinner data set to have slightly higher intensities. Uh, whereas for the moderately weak reflections, this reverses, so the thinner data set has slightly lower intensity than the thick. And this, this kind of pattern seems consistent across the three uh, crystals that we looked at. Um, so we're still puzzling over what this means, and I, I don't really want to attempt any interpretation yet. And there's a complicating factor, uh, one of which is that uh, the, the, one of the data sets were recorded with a C to D detector, which has worse uh, 
noise properties than the Falcon 3 or the time pix detector used in the previous studies I showed. Um, but uh, what, another thing that we're doing in the CCP4 group is, as well as that sort of previous uh, top-down experimental approach at looking at this, we're, we're looking at this from a bottom-up theoretical approach. And this is led by Tarek, who started as a postdoc at CCP4 less than a year ago and has been working largely in lockdown on um, simulation methods for electron diffraction. Uh, and it, one such method is multi-slice simulation, which a sample is divided into thin slices and a scattering calculation is performed at each slice. Um, and this is early stage work as well. We're looking at small molecules to begin with to make the simulations uh, tractable whilst we're just developing the methods. And at the moment we can show certainly that you have um, quite dramatic effects on intensity with thickness uh, going from uh, full uh, maxima at some, some thicknesses right down to complete extinction of certain um, reflections uh, with different periods uh, for each reflection. So th this is something that's understood in the dynamic theory of diffraction, but it's obviously too perfect to fit to the real much subtle effects in, in the experiments. So uh, the key to this work is relaxing those assumptions of perfection. Uh, and the Abrahams group has um, taken the lead in this by modeling inelastic and solvent, solvent scattering uh, in simulations. Um, and we hope we're getting into a position to also contribute to that area. Uh, so at, finally, as I'm running out of time, um, just wanted to say that there's very much I'm yet to understand about electron diffraction and uh, probably this talk has made that quite obvious. But I strongly believe in collaboration and sharing of results, and I hope to learn from others by doing so. Um, and to that end, I set up a community on Zenodo for 3D ED uh, micro ED datasets. And all the datasets I talked about today are up there. Um, and the intention behind this com community is for methods developers to, to work on improving results, even for unfinished datasets that haven't necessarily resulted in a structure. So I'll finish there, and as I'm running slightly late, I won't go through everyone's names, but uh, thank you to everyone who's helped out, and thank you to the funders. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>